you know what the term that I hate the most when people introduce me like in readings? They say successful writer. For me, it's an oxymoron. If you're successful, so why do you fucking write, you know? <laughs> if you're successful, go there and be successful. Don't sit in a room and kind of make up characters that never existed, you know, that, that seek to begin with. Do you like books? I'm outlining a new writing project. Who wrote this book? Read it. Read it. Sometimes I'd write something. What are you writing? Have you written anything lately? I'm Amanda Stern, and this is Bookable. On today's show, tackling the absurdities of life with humor. Let's face it, life is hard. I have no idea what I'm doing. I totally embarrassed myself last night. I don't understand. You don't understand. Oh, the humanity. It's filled with indignities, miscommunications, and loss. But if you don't stop and laugh at it all, <laughs> life is funny. Who am I? It will overwhelm you. <gasps> hey! Oh, you look younger. What, what do you oh, do? You know? Well, our guest today it's a good face that they put on. gives a masterclass on how to use humor to save your life. Time for an introduction. Hi, my name is Edgar Carrot, and I'm the writer of the story collection Flower Already. Edgar Carrot. Fly Already is the latest example of Edgar's uncanny ability to take the everyday, both the mundane and the thrilling, and see it in a completely novel way. Okay, so take my very first question. It's just a simple setup that I like to ask an author so that they give me a concise description of their book. Edgar went his own way with the answer. If you were working in a bookstore and you had to hand sell your book... How would you describe it? Well, if a customer came and I had to sell this book to him? Yeah. I would say, you know, fuck it, this book is for better people than you. It always works. Like I, I would say, it's, it's, too, it's too good for you. It's too smart for you. You'll never get it. Go get another book. Go go buy yourself a, a kebab in some, some place. Welcome to the Israeli version of Br'er Rabbit. Don't throw me in the briar patch. Fly Already is a fast-paced collection of 22 short stories, some of them only a couple of pages long, all about our inability to connect and understand the world around us. A few years ago, I was walking with my son on the beach, and my son, when we walk on the beach, then he has kind of this ambiguous feeling that on the one hand, you know, it's beautiful and the scent feels great under his feet and you know, and you have the soothing sound of water. But on the other hand, he's not playing Fortnite, so he's a priorically bored, you know? So as we were walking, he said to me, Dad, could you do me a favor? I said, sure. And he said, can you be funny? And my instinct was to say, how can I be funny? Everything's okay. Mm. And, the, and I think that there is something about kind of, for me, let's say there's something about humor that it's the only way I know that you can keep your dignity uh, when when something humiliating is happening. You know, it's like, I mean, if you uh, if you spill a cup of coffee over, on your pants, you know, then you could either say, oh, fuck, shit, what is this? You know, or you could say, oh, I'm such a poor person. Oh, why does it always happen to me? And in both cases, you'll be pathetic. But if you can crack a joke on it, it's basically, it's kind of an, a way to continue contain it and and to keep some of your dignity and i'm saying and since life by definition is a humiliating experience you know like i mean you know why did why do they have to make us this way that we, we have to shit why did they have to do it that when we fought it smells so bad why why do you know why does our sweat sm smell bad why do we want uh, so much uh, sexual intercourse and, and s statistically most of the other people do not want to have it with us, you know. Why, why do we have to die in the end? All those kind of things, you know. It's like, how can you handle it if you don't have some humor? Mm -hmm. That's true. Again, you know, it's like, I mean, when you go into a car, you don't have buttons that you can press on and the airbag will appear. It will be there, you know, when all other things will fail. From the story Ladder, in Fly Already, page 121. We don't force anyone to stay here, Zvi. If you're not happy, we can easily transfer you. I don't want to go to hell, Raphael. You know that. To the best of my knowledge, 
Those are the only two options. And if you really want to be an angel here, you have to be happy. An angel has to be at peace with himself. Serene, that's the word I'm looking for. Because even if it's not written down somewhere, it's part of the job description. You've said that you don't write stories about something that's happened. You write about something that moves you. So I'm curious to know what moved you to write the short story, Letters. Uh, well, you know, this is a short story about an angel that, uh, that kind of uh, misses his life as a living human being and misses this kind of uh, interaction with humans. And it's kind of, it's written in the word in which God is already dead. And basically the angels are just doing their stuff. And he tries to convince them that, that, that he'll, he'll connect between them and, and humanity. But they say, you know, since God is dead, we have nothing to do with humanity. And those people, you know, and those people, you know, they, they sin, they smell bad. You know, we don't want to do anything with them. And I think that this story is really maybe a lot about this kind of a fear of a, of a comf comfortable, cozy lives, about this kind of life in which uh, you don't have any friction with the world around you, and the moment that everything that you want is just around, then you kind of lose your yearning. And I think that, you know, yearning, let's say for me, is yearning and humor, are the two kind of uh, traits that make human beings human beings. You know, it's, I think that's what differentiates uh, humans from, I don't know, animals. Also, I'm, my rabbit has a sense of humor, but, but he's an exception. And, and I think that, and I think that, uh, that uh, this idea of kind of, uh, of kind of wanting to feel, you know, is something that... Uh, I always connected to. I remember that in uh, William Faulkner's uh, Wild Palm, there is this sentence uh, between nothing and grief, I will always choose grief. And I think that the, the angel in letter is the one that would prefer grief to nothing. Mm. It's like, you know, the angel, when, when he was alive, he was in the Israeli Defense Force, he was in the IDF, mm -hmm. and his job was to go and tell families that their loved one died. You know, it's a kind of like a, a son or a husband. And I think that, that kind of in a, in a strange way, so of course it's like the worst job in the world, you know, but the, this kind of a feeling of loss that he experienced was something that he missed, you know, this, uh, this, this thing, this ability to want something that you will not have, to acknowledge the fact that you had kind of a deep connection to something compared to this kind of a, I don't know, a well-being that he felt as an angel. He, 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 he missed this, this passion. From the story Dad with Mashed Potatoes in Flyer Ready, page 105. Stella, Ella, and I were almost 10 years old the day Dad shapeshifted. Mom doesn't like us to say shapeshifted and insists that we say left, but it's not like we came home from school that day and found the house empty, because there he was, waiting for us in the armchair, glowing in the full whiteness of his glorious rabbit hood. And when we bent to pet him behind the ears, he didn't try to run away. He just wrinkled his nose with happiness. The past few years, I, I've been having these sensations that I'm understanding life less and less. You know, it's really like I, I had those moments. I remember that I was sitting with my son. I think he was about, I don't know, 10 or 11 years old. And we saw on the news a uh, uh, Trump uh, recording when he said uh, grabs him by the pussy. Uh -huh. And I said, I explained to my son, I said, you see this guy? He's finished. He's done. You know, in two days, he's going to sell pencils, you know, on, on Broadway. You know, people are going to throw coins in. He's done. And then, like, my son said, Dad, do you remember the guy that you said that he was done? Yes, he was just elected the president of the U.S. So, so I'm saying in general, I had this kind of feeling that, you know, that the structure of things, the way that societies uh, operate, and even like, you know, new apps that they couldn't work, uh, operate, you know, all this kind of thing, it seemed as if I've reached this stage that I was kind of like in a spaceship getting further and further from Earth and understanding less and less. And I think that these stories... Those, those stories are many times about this kind of wish uh, 
to understand more, to belong more, this yearning for a word that makes more sense. Mm-hmm. It's funny because living in America with Donald Trump as president, it feels like living in an Edgar Carrot story. Because I live in Israel with Benjamin Netanyahu. So, True. So I write about the same kind of reality only in a different accent. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> it's like the racism is targeted toward other people, but, you know, it's like we don't have any Mexicans, so, so it's against Arabs, but it's basically the same system. And you write often about the human need for connection. Do you feel more often than not, I mean, you sort of answered the question, but more often than not disconnected from people? Uh, yes, but I totally digress, but because I mentioned Mexicans, and I have to tell you a Mexican okay. story. Oh, okay? good. So one of the countries that I'm uh, most popular outside of Israel is Mexico. Huh. And uh, when I came for my first kind of a, a, a reading tour in Mexico, a, I, I, I did the book signing at the end of the event. And when I do the book signing, you know, like about the, the fifth or sixth guy, after I write the book, you know, for Hector or something, <laughs> and he doesn't speak any English, and he asks me something in Spanish, por favor, or something, you know. And I know that in book signing, whenever somebody asks you something, they ask if they can have a selfie, because what would they ask, you know. So, so I said, sure, you know, no problem. And I stood up, you know, for the selfie, and then the guy hugged me. Oh. And it was really like a nice, warm, cozy hug, you know. I said, oh, wow, that was nice. And then the guy left, and then like about 10 minutes later this lady asked me something and said yeah so this is the selfie lady uh, and I said sure and she hugged me too and then I did this tour and basically what, what happened is that every place I read about a few people you know two or three people asked to hug me and they hugged me and they were all nice hugs I must say <laughs> and uh, when my my publisher drove me to the airport uh, uh, I said to him you know I've read in many countries but I think that Mexico is the, the most beautiful and moving country to live in because it's the only country I know in the world where uh, readers uh, hug the writers. And my publisher says, oh, the, we, we don't hug writers here. We just hug you. <laughs> and I said to him, what do you mean? And he said, you know, I, I, I'm a publisher for many years. I never saw any person hug any writers, but in your reading, I don't know why they keep uh, hugging you. And I said to him, but come on, but you know, you must have some kind of an explanation. He's, so he said, maybe after finishing your book, they feel like you need a hug, you know? And I thought to myself, it's so true, because I think that there is something about my books that they're all about kind of this kind of loneliness and, and yearning for human connections. And, you know, and the Mexicans, they got it, you know, they really got it. Time for a short break. When we come back, One man goes to extraordinary lengths to score a joint, and it changes the way he sees the entire world. Plus, Edgar invites us to a risque dinner party. Stick around. Hey, it's Amanda, here with a great book podcast recommendation. It's called Storybound, and it features top literary icons reading their essays, poems, and fiction. Season one includes readings from Mitch Albom, Lydia Yuknovich, Adele Waldman, Nathan Hill, Caitlin Doty, and Mitchell S. Jackson. And despite not being a literary icon yet, I'll be appearing as a guest on season two. Each episode is paired with a talented and unique musician to provide an immersive sound environment and score. Storybound is brought to you by The Podglomerate. You can listen to every episode of season one today. Season two launches this summer. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening to this show. Welcome back to Bookable. I'm Amanda Stern, here with Edgar Carrot, author of the short story collection Flyer Eddie. One standout story in the collection is called One Gram Short. It skillfully shows the lengths we'll go to for love and how those experiences change us along the way. So it's basically a story about a guy who has a crush on the waitress in the place where he had coffee every morning. And he wants to hit on her, but he's afraid that if he'll hit on her and she'll say no, it will be awkward every time you come to drink coffee, you know, you have to deal with the fact that he was rejected. And he learns that she likes to smoke pot. 
So he has this idea that if he'll have a joint, he can offer her to, that they'll smoke together. And, uh, and if she kind of agree, you know, it will create some kind of intimacy and it can go somewhere. And if she say no, then he'll know that she's not interested. And he goes on this quest to, uh, to get the joint. And, uh, and it becomes really, really difficult. And for me, this guy is kind of like this hipster. Like, I mean, if he would live here, we would be living in Williamsburg uh, of his parents' uh, money. And, uh, and uh, then, like, you know, this quest for, to find this kind of joint, which is like really like kind of finding the Holy Grail, uh, makes him mix with all those things in the Middle East that he wants to suppress because he wants to believe that he lives in Williamsburg, but he's not. So it has to do with uh, xenophobia toward the Arabs, uh, the violence that you find in the Middle East. And in the end, he returns with this joint, but he returns a changed man. You know, he's already like, it's not like I'm a handsome guy, you're a handsome woman, how about we have do some handsome lovemaking? <laughs> But it's like I'm a battered guy, and and you know, and we life is much more difficult uh, than I think it is. And the fantasies that I had was, which was like kind of a Coca-Cola commercial, turns to something to turns to something that would be more like a potential support group of two. Do you want to say what? a little bit about what they have to go through in order to get yes, the pot? So, so the idea is that he has a friend from high school who smokes a lot of pot, but because of the, in Israel, the pot situation has to do, a lot to do with our uh, political situation, because usually pot is smuggled either from Lebanon or from Egypt, and at the time, you know, there are problems both in the northern border with Lebanon and also in the southern border with, with Egypt, so there's no pot to be found. And uh, they get to the house of this uh, lawyer, who gets medical marijuana, and this lawyer, he's uh, uh, fighting this case that uh, 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 of two parents that their uh, daughter was killed in a hit and run accident by an Arab driver, and they're suing him for a lot of money. And the lawyer says that uh, because uh, you know the Arabs they have a very big families that they're always together, he knows that the court will be full with all the supporters of uh, this guy. And uh, he wants, he will pay our two friends in with pot uh, if they come to to the courtroom and they uh, shout at the at the accused, you know, say to him, "You murderer! You plucked a, fa- a flower! You killed a child!" Hoping that this will kind of affect the judge and and make him kind of and will be some kind of counterweight to the support that the driver will get from his family. And uh, and basically, uh, as him and his friend are there, his friend who really wants the pot hard started getting into cursing, and uh, because the driver is an Arab, he starts being uh, openly racist and saying basically blaming him for being a terrorist and doing all those kind of nasty things, and uh, that cre- that creates some kind of a riot in the courtroom in which our friend gets. Uh, badly beaten. The guy in the story, he's overtly racist, but I try to not to write this kind of kind of alienated, uh, outright racist, like look at this monster, but he's basically, you know, he's just, uh, he wants to do what will work for him. He wants the pot, you know, so if the, if the, the driver was fat, he would shout fat, so you know, and if he was ugly, he would uh, shout ugly face. And the fact that he's an Arab seems to him, to him rightly so, as a, as a point of weakness. It's something to pick on, you know. It, we live in a, in a world and in a country that if you're Arab and Muslim, then the way that you can get sympathy to yourself and people who reject the other is, would be to, to kind of point out this person's difference. Yeah. And yet he really wanted that pot, so he was he auditioning. Really and he got it. He, and he got, got it. it in the end. He did. Um, but, you know, we're not so sure about the guy and the girl, so yeah, people are going to have to read. Yeah, we're not so sure about the guy and the girl, but what we're sure is that, you know, is that even if they'll be together, our guy is not the same guy. You know, he, he, will, he knows that he will not have a future out of a Coca-Cola commercial. You know, he knows 
that there is life out there and that there is suffering there and that maybe you'll have somebody to go through this kind of tough experience together, but that it's not going to be only kind of a, 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 a almond milk cappuccino in Williamsburg, you know. Mm-hmm. It's going to be something a, li- a little bit tougher than that. From the story, Evolution of a Breakup in Flyer Eddy, page 207. At first, we were a cell, then an amoeba, then a fish, and after a very long and frustrating era, we became a lizard. That was the era when, as we recall, the earth felt soft and unsteady beneath our feet. So we climbed a tree. Up there in the treetops, we felt secure. At some point, we climbed down and started walking upright and speaking. And as soon as we began speaking, we just couldn't stop. It's funny because in in the story, it basically, it's uh, written in the first person plural. And it's basically about a couple that been so long together, you know, it starts like in it's it starts to say in the beginning we were an amoeba and then a cell and then we became a fish and then we came out of the water. That that they don't remember anything that preceded them being together. And the uh, and this kind of a uh, we think thing kind of becomes suffocating and it's a story about about kind of a uh, uh, breaking up from w- somebody that you've been with so long that you can't even imagine your life with, without him or her. And how many pages is that story? I think it's two, right? Or it's two or three, I don't know. I feel like it's a page and a half. Maybe, yeah, page and a half. Yeah, it's, it could be two, but it's really short. Yes. Yeah, and amazing. I th- is That's the last story in the collection. It's the last story, yeah. And was there a method to the order? Uh, with me, it's kind of it's more some kind of a rhythm than than you know than something that is rational. Uh, I think that, let's say there are stories that that when they end, I say, okay, I need to have a, a lighter story right now, you know, or a story that is very long, and after it, there is a, a short story that's a little bit like a sorbet, you know, that will wash off the, the taste of that old story, but. Uh, with the evolution of breakup, break up, I think that what made me uh, put it in the end is the fact that the last word in the story is alone. And there was something that I felt that something about this collection that it should end with this word alone. Yeah, it was powerful. It was kind of amazing to start it at the father and the young kid and then end it at the sort of older... Yeah, it's, I, I think I think that there is something in the story that that kind of deals with this idea of, of loneliness because I, I think that uh, that it's not like that you're lonely only if you're alone. You can be lonely when you're with other people, and I think that uh, that with me, writing is often associated with this feeling of aloneness. It's it's a way of fighting your loneliness and your feeling of being alone. And it like you know, and I could be in a party. And then say, oh, you know, I have a headache. I have to, need to go home and go and write. And the reason that I write is to kind of fight this loneliness that I, that I feel. Because it's worse feeling lonely when you're with other people, I think. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, and you can't masturbate. Well, No, but, but it's like I always have this kind of image of somebody who's very lonely and masturbating. But I can't have an image of somebody sitting in a dinner and kind of being very feeling very long and masturbating at the table but 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 it should maybe it should be tried more so and after that we can kind of we speak can. our opinions about it that's a i think that's a really good idea yeah like if you go i don't know to to your, to meet your boyfriend's family and you know and you start talking about you know selling the garage you know and about stuff like that you know you can masturbate and maybe you feel less alone and okay if they prove only, like if they prove of your masturbating. Well, I'm going to have to first get a boyfriend. Okay. Edgar Carrot, author of Flyer Ready. It's published by Riverhead and is available now. Bookable is a production of Loud Tree Media. I'm your host, Amanda Stern, five feet tall and off to Mexico to get some hugs. 
were produced by me, Bo Friedlander, and Andrew Dunn, who also mixed and sound designed the show. Bo is Loud Tree's editor in chief. Find us on the web at bookablepod.com. And please subscribe and rate us five stars on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your shows. That's one of the very best ways for other listeners to find Bookable. We know Edgar masterfully uses humor to address life's problems. But his son? He's going to use Novocaine. My son wants, when he grows up, they ask him in school, he says he wants to be a dentist in Toronto. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's how how an artist child rebels, you know. Yeah. So he's asking why why do you want to be a dentist? And he said, well, people will always have problems with their teeth. And he said, why Toronto? And he said, the Middle East is too warm for me. This is bookable.